Okay, so I'm Simon, I'm the CTO of uh, Para, and who are you? Um, my name is Joost Meijerink, uh, I'm a product designer, um, so yeah, for Para. So I'm going to talk a little bit about technical things and then Joost will talk about more interesting things. Um, yeah, so what is uh, Para? So Para is, um, well we call ourselves a startup, but we started in uh, 2015. Uh, we do uh, what we now call AI. AI-powered candidate screening. Uh, so we ask uh, candidates to give us some natural language and then we run that through various AI, machine learning type of models to come up with scores. Uh, so we serve the HR industry. Uh, so it's kind of a SaaS platform built on top of um, Django since uh, 2015. And personally, I've been using Django since uh, uh, two th uh, yeah, 2004, uh, so 20 years. So. I'm the champion of uh, long Django users. Um, um, so what is uh, Hotspot? Uh, so Hotspot is a CRM uh, with um, sort of a CMS bolted onto it. Um, and the uh, problem with the CMS is that it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's a hosted CMS. So um, if you're developing for it, there's no sort of local testing, etc. So it's a very long uh, code debug type of cycle. Uh, of course, they have a proprietary um, CMS uh, uh, database. And um, yeah, well, it does have an API, so that's a good thing. And uh, templating language uh, similar to uh, Django's, of course. So uh, we're going to tell you a story of how we got up here. Um, so when the company started, they said, oh, we need a website. Now, the tech team wasn't going to build them a website. Um, so they said, OK, we'll, we'll make it with WordPress. Okay, and then they said, oh, well, this is the marketing team. Oh, well, we can't modify it to do what we want. So they said, can you help us, tech? And we said, we're not going to touch WordPress because <laughs> we all had uh, PHP, PTSD. Um, yeah, so, okay, make us a website. All right, so, you know, in order to reduce the load, we used a, like a static uh, sort of HTML type of um, generator, which used a markdown, which is a you know, plain text language. Uh, but then it turns out marketing apparently can't, can't possibly write anything in plain text. Uh, so they said, oh, I can't understand. Uh, so at this point, I said, well, show me all the documents you've written in Word. Yeah, okay, that's also zero. Anyway. Um, they need a new website. Now, at this point, sales had adopted HubSpot, so, oh, we can put a website in HubSpot using the HubSpot CMS. Great. So they hired a, a marketing agency to build the HubSpot uh, templates. Then, of course, they rebranded the company again. So they hired another website agency to build another set of HubSpot templates. Um, and then, finally, they decided that the, the current sort of third generation of HubSpot templates were really not working for them, and they need to do it yet again. Um, um, and at that point, they said, came back, can you help us? And what did we say? Yeah, we're not going to touch HubSpot. <laughs> yeah. OK, but they're desperate, so please make us a new website. So we looked around, and we chose Wagtail, of course, because you know, we've been using Python for so long and Django for so long, actually there's really not much choice. And everyone's happy. Okay. Well, in reality, <laughs> um, so we thought, okay, well, how difficult can it be to build a dub 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 site? We thought, okay, we can knock this out in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we can get to try new stuff, which, you know, engineers always like. And we only have to do it right, you know, once. Yeah, famous last words. So, four months later, a few weeks ago, yeah, we went live. And here it is. And uh, we're very proud of it. And uh, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. So, please visit our website. Um, yeah. So, let's get technical for a little bit. Um, so in terms of uh, system architecture, pretty standard. This is just, um, this is basically a simplified version of what our product is. Um, 
So, um, yeah, the front end is served by, uh, by Caddy. Uh, so for us, that's new because we were using Nginx, and Caddy is much, much easier, so I really uh, recommend it. Um, the Django process is running in Hypercorn, which we chose over Daphne because it has uh, automated restarts, and you know, it's AGSI because we wanted to try AGSI rather than UWSGI. Uh, the database is on the back end, of course, uh, Postgres and Redis. And for a queuing system, we use a thing called RQ. If you need a queuing system, I really make it recommend RQ. It's built on top of Redis. It's really simple. The code is really quite small. And you can you know, sort of understand the code and really sort of debug what's going on for when your queuing system stops working. Uh, and of course, the, the static assets are served on uh, CloudFront uh, from S3. Um, so our deploy architecture looks like this. Um, uh, so we push code into um, GitHub Actions. Uh, that triggers an action which um, builds the, the back end as the Docker image, which we push into the uh, Elastic Container Registry of um, AWS. That triggers another action, which checks out the code again, and then builds uh, the front-end assets, or pulls all the front-end assets and builds it into a, you know, Webpack packages. Um, and then it, it, it sort of pulls the newly built Docker image and then uses that to run um, collect static, which then distributes uh, all the static images, uh, code, all the static images, all the JavaScript, et cetera, into S3. And then we um, trigger another image which uses Helm to deploy uh, into the Kubernetes cluster. So static images first, static assets first, then deploy the code which is uh, expecting those images and static assets to be there. Very important to get that the right way around, we discovered. Um, yeah, so um, talking to HubSpot, so the, 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 the sales team, of course, still use HubSpot as a CRM. Um, and the function of the website is, of course, to, to capture leads, et cetera. So we, um, we need to um, capture data in, in our site and then do some processing on it and then send it into the HubSpot um, uh, database. Uh, so on the left is the, um, is the UI from, from Wagtail, and on the right is how it's rendered in our, in our website. Um, so. HubSpot um, forms, they all have a unique uh, identifier, which is a, basically a UUID. Uh, so what we do is we, um, we record that UUID because we might have multiple forms on a page, right? And then we, um, we, send, we, we, we send to the front end the block ID. Uh, so the block ID allows us to get back to the HubSpot ID, which is allows us then to post that into HubSpot. Um, so once we've got a, if, we, if we've got a page URI, we can go from a page URI to a page object, and we can, given a page object, we can run along all the blocks in the page, we can find the, the right block ID, and then from that we, f we can figure out the HubSpot form ID, and then send that back uh, to HubSpot. So in terms of flow, what it looks like is the back end is sending to the front end um, the, the, uh, the block ID and the data that they, that they want, uh, so basically the form structure. The front end renders the form in some kind of rudimentary uh, React uh, code, which I put together. Um, then it posts back uh, to the back end, you know, which page was this and which block was it? And the, and the back end th then figures out, you know, what I need to do with that, uh, puts it into the queuing system, and then the queuing system sends it back into the gaping moor of HubSpot to, uh, to go into the uh, uh, CRM. So, oh, we got a new um, new contact on the database, et cetera, or somebody wants to download some content, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so that's kind of how the flow works. Um, so, I mean, it basically works, it's live, all's good, uh, but um, we just built the forms that we need, so we're kind of hard-coded, you know, kind of download forms or contact forms. Um, in the future, we could make it generic if we ever have any time to do this. So we can, you can actually read from the HubSpot API the sort of uh, like a JSON structure of how the, how the form is, is meant to be configured or displayed. And then we could write something which would then um, you know, render that properly into the, uh, into the front end and then into the back end. But right now, it's just basically predefined. So that's my bit. And now, here's Joost. Yes. Yeah, so um, as a CMS, um, 
Yeah, the perfect CMS. Well, uh, I've been working as a designer for uh, a lot of years. Uh, started as a graph at a graphic design company. Um, fell in love with uh, web design and uh, started uh, designing uh, websites. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. And they were built in WordPress. And I was like, oh, this is good. Um, well, later on, I uh, met a lot more developers. And they were like, WordPress is uh, shit. Um, <laughs> well, anyways. Um, Let's get back uh, over uh, in the future a couple of years. Uh, I started working for a marketing agency which actually built their own uh, CMS. So I designed their uh, CMS, uh, which is um, yeah, one of the most fun uh, projects I had. And that actually sparked my interest in becoming a real product designer. So designing uh, actual products instead of just websites. And again, a couple of years later, I joined Para. Uh, this was uh, one year ago. and. I saw this amazing uh, website built in HubSpot. <laughs> well, this is sarcasm, but anyways, um, I was immediately uh, yeah, just sending a lot of feedback to marketing, like, can we do this differently? Uh, there was a well terrible uh, way of just managing the content, which is uh, the core of what it should do. So uh, I'm going to zoom in on a couple of requirements I had. As a designer, I want. There, there are a lot of more requirements, of course, but I want three things. Uh, simple stacking of blocks. Um, so, I, But I want there to be some logic to it, right? I w if I see a website, I want it to be nice. I want the margins to be correct. Um, I want to predefine what templates you can use. This is one of the quirks that some uh, CMSs have. You can add, like, Pages anywhere. You can add an article detail page uh, as a direct child of, of, of a contact page, whatever. Uh, you can do anything, uh, just select a different template and you're all good to go. So I want to predefine and I want to allow some templates to be shown in different places. And the third one is a Dutch uh, term, Hufter proof. I don't want uh, WYSIWYG uh, rich sex fields. Um, I'm a designer. I want things to look uh, really neat. I want it to, yeah. I don't want uh, some content uh, marketeer to just completely mess my design. Um, so this is why I want to predefine what allowed content elements there are within blocks. So let's zoom in on the first one, simple stacking. Well, I also worked as a front-end developer for a couple of years, which was one of my side thingies. So I made the front-end, or at least the HTML and CSS. I'm a visual guy, so I don't like JavaScript. I just want the things to look pretty. Um, so simple stacking, how did I solve this? Well, w what we have is we have three different backgrounds. Uh, probably it looks like one here because the contrast is really bad on this Beamer. But anyways, um, we have the off-white version, which is actually the one in the center. There's a border, you can see it. We have a white background and we have, uh, sorry, an off-white, a beige, and a, a colored background. So that's one thing you have to keep in mind, right? They have the second thing that adds to it, we have different types of margins between blocks. We have like this one on the top, it's a, a small bit, it's 48 pixels, 3 RAM in our case, we use uh, 16 pixels of course. And we have default uh, spaces. So the first thing I did is, is I just wrote some generic code to just fix this. Um, and it worked. Uh, if you combine two blocks, it uses the, the correct margin. And well, this is a, the, a, simple, a simplified version of it. But anyways, this is what we do in SCSS. Um, and it just, lo oh, yeah, I love CSS, uh, SCSS. So uh, it, it just works good. Yeah, you can actually see the, the different backgrounds here. But anyways, <laughs> believe me, it works. Um, the second one, which I said, was uh, the predefined templates. Um, well, the only thing that's actually predefined in our templates is the header. Um, anything else, well, it's just a, a, a block area, right? It's, it's a place where people can put blocks. Um, so anything between the header and between the footer is, is actually free um, to use the blocks I define, of course, um, because I don't want people to just ram random blocks in, a, in some pages. So. First one is, of course, a home template with a nice hero header with a lot of color. Then we made a second version of that, which is for landing pages, just a bit yeah, less uh, distracting header, just a cleaner view. Uh, then we made a, a default page, of course. Um, 
We have resources, which is like, a, a, well, yeah, well, it has different types of resources in there. So a type page below that would be the articles page, and below that, of course, is a, a detail page. Is it shown already? Hmm. Yeah, so this is the detail page. So this is uh, one of the ways I um, limit the content marketeers to do uh, what I want, um, basically. <laughs> then hoof to proof, and it's one extra level. Um, I want to restrain them from using any content element they want. So uh, what we have is blocks. So this is, for example, a call to action. And blocks are different types of elements, right? So we have blocks. Uh, a featured slider would show something like this. So there are like a couple of customer stories. You can click through them and go to their detail page, of course. And we have the image and text block, which is, I sometimes call it a zigzag, because you see these a lot on SaaS websites, right? Image on the left, text on the right, and then we switch it around a lot. So it's um, a basic block. But let's zoom into that one, right? It's a block, but actually it's a block with blocks within, um, because you have text, uh, you have list items, you have images, videos, whatever. Uh, in this case, I limit them from using images. Uh, because I don't want images next to like a large, beautiful image. And button groups. But that presents us with the next problem, right? Uh, we make blocks with blocks within, with blocks within. Um, which is one of the requirements I have of a CMS. And a lot of the CMSs don't actually work this way. Um, but, then again, um, luckily for us, Wagtail has stream fields. So this is one of the things we use a lot. And this is also uh, where I get it back to Simon with a famous quote. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we love stream fields. It's stream fields all the way down in our system. It's blocks within blocks within blocks. But um, this is a, really a question to the audience. Maybe uh, I missed something when I was developing it. So, um, yeah, so you can have a stream, stream block within a stream field in, and it renders in the UI, for, in, in the editing UI. Uh, but I can't put a struct block within a stream field. Um, I have to sort of either make a list or embed it within a stream block. So we end up with this sort of double hierarchy in, in the editing UI where we've got like abstract and then within abstract there's another abstract. Where really, I just wanted, we just wanted one uh, in, the, in the UI and I spent a long time reading the code. I really couldn't figure out how to just give us sort of one level of, let's say, uh, uh, blocks. So please let me know if I missed something. Um, and, yeah, a warning about um, JSON in the databases. Uh, so I, I feel a bit about JSON in the database similar to re regular expressions. So there's a famous quote from Zawinski, you know, if you, if you think you're going to solve a problem with regexes, now you've got two problems. So that's a bit of how, how I feel about putting, storing JSON in the database, you know, now, you, now you've got two problems. Uh, because, you know, data structures change, so JSON needs migrations. I know Wagtail has, uh, has uh, stream field um, uh, migrations. And, you know, if you, if you forget about that and then you update your stream blocks, your stream fields, and then just, just, just run the code again, then, you, you know, your, your, your page is going to crash. So I, if, if I was doing it again, I, I might look at like whether generic you know foreign keys could probably do something uh, equally good and just as a small aside to all any any sort of back-end developers in the room if if you ever give a front-end developers um, the ability to read and write data into a sort of a random json field they're going to use it to store state application state uh, and then they're going to blame you when the front end st stops working so yeah don't do that <laughs> um yeah Done. Any questions?